Hmm, having a connection problem with Jim. I can see, oh, here he is, connecting to the audio. Very good, yes. As soon as Jim is, oh, there we go. I'm on, right? All right. Morning. Morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll turn things over to Jim. Uh, I'll go ahead, and, here we go. Good morning. All right, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bible Church of Lakeshore Sunday School class with uh, Mr. Jim Timmons, and he will uh, he will take over in the book of Hebrews now for Sunday School. I'll go ahead and turn it all over to him and stop my, I'll mute myself here, and uh, I've already stopped my video. Except me, except me. <laughs> yep, not you. Yes, just myself. Here. <laughs> yeah. Yourself and everybody else, too. Uh, no interruptions. <laughs> Okay, am I ready? Am I? Okay. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 8 this morning. And, but before we begin, of course, we'll have a, a word of prayer, asking God's blessing on our study. Heavenly Father, we, we just rejoice in your love and your blessings each and every day. It's difficult times we're living in with this quarantine business and the, the coronavirus, uh, Lord, but uh, we ask for your protection. Uh, for ourselves, our family members, our church members, and uh, our pastor, Pastor Hoppy, and his family as well. And, uh, watch over us. Uh, we we yearn to get back together in fellowship, and and we know that's coming soon, Lord. So uh, we just rejoice in that, Lord. Uh, give our government leaders uh, wisdom and guidance in in uh, in leading us uh, through this uh, epidemic. Uh, President uh, Trump and. Uh, Vice President Pence and our governor, Governor Larry Hogan, here in Maryland as well, Lord. Uh, Lord, we're, we're looking at uh, your word today, Hebrews chapter 8. Uh, we ask that you open up your word to our hearts that we might uh, uh, understand it and, and take it to our hearts and, and apply it to our lives, Lord. Uh, your teaching is always a blessing, and uh, today is no exception, Lord. So we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Uh, let me give you a little introduction to Hebrews chapter 8 before we begin. Uh, the, the earthly Old Testament priests of Israel, they, they were sort of a, a shadow of, of Christ. Uh, he, Christ is our eternal priest up in heaven. And uh, the Old Testament priests used the blood sacrifices of animals to provide a, a covering for sin. So, so God would remain with his people there in the temple and the the presence of God and in the tabernacle uh, before the temple. And, uh, but Jesus, Jesus shed his own blood for the remission of sins so God could live with his people forever. Jesus' death and resurrection provided a new covenant, which we're going to be looking at today. And it was a new covenant between God and man and a whole new priesthood, a royal priesthood of Melchizedek not the Old uh, Testament priesthood of uh, Aaron. Jesus is forever our high priest. You know, you, know, you ever ask a question or, or think about it during this study, uh, why is a high priest needed in heaven if Jesus' death on Calvary was a full and final atonement uh, for, for uh, our sins? Uh, what's, the, what's the reason for having a high priest? Well, let me... Uh, let me tell you, once I get this thing, I, I got a computer here to, with uh, my uh, highlights on it, and, I, and it's the first time I'm using it, so I'm a little little rusty on getting this thing going. Uh, let me see, okay. Well, I'm gonna have to go to paper. And uh, so uh, Jesus is our, our high priest, and uh, you know, although uh, Jesus has uh, uh, paid the, the penalty for our sin and finished the work on Calvary, we still have a, a, a sin nature within us. Each and every one of us has that sin nature. And uh, because of that, it puts a barrier between us and our fellowship with a holy God. So the heavenly ministry of our Lord answers this need. Through his sacrifice on earth, we have our forgiveness. Through his priesthood in heaven, 
we're kept in fellowship with, uh, with God. Uh, verse 25 of uh, the previous chapter, we studied chapter 7, we looked at this last week. It brings uh, this truth to light. It says, wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing his, he, he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now, chapter 8 of Hebrews, which we're going to be looking at today, declares that Jesus is the superior priest who mediates a superior covenant. So let's begin our study with, with verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 8. And that reads, uh, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who sat on the right hand of the throne of majesty, of the majesty in the heavens. So there, in verse 1, uh, what the writer is saying is this, Christ, whose priesthood he had described back in chapter 7, is indeed our high priest and is seated in the place of the greatest honor on the right hand of God the Father. There was never a chair in that Old Testament cha tabernacle for a priest in the line of Aaron to sit upon. That was because there was always work to do with continual sacrifices. When Jesus said it was finished on Calvary's cross, the work of redemption was indeed finished and completed forever. So he is seated because he finished our redemption. He asks only that we accept it through, through our trust and, and belief in, the, in the God's son, Jesus. In Jesus, we have a superior high priest who ministers on the basis of a much superior covenant. He was called in this position by God the Father with a new covenant to minister to God's people. Now look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So it's talking about Jesus here. The earthly tabernacle where the Jews worship was only a copy or a shadow of the one that where in heaven where the Lord ministers. And then, believe it or not, it was made by the Lord himself up there in heaven. You know, he got up there to prepare a place for us, but I imagine that temple is, uh, that he made, the tabernacle is really something to see, and we'll rejoice and be seeing it uh, when our time on earth is past. Now, now look at verses three and four. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices Wherefore, it is a necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he, would, he should not be a priest, seeing that uh, there are priests who, that offer gifts according to the law. So since every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and, and sacrifices, Christ must make an offering also. The sacrifice Jesus offers is far better than those offered by the Old Testament priests. Even so, if he were here on earth, he wouldn't even be permitted to be a priest. You have to be of the tribe of Levi, and Jesus in his earthly body was of the tribe of Judah. And because earthly priests still followed the old Jewish uh, system of sacrifices, uh, that's another reason, too, he wouldn't be permitted. He, 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 he gave a sacrifice of his own life, but the, the Old Testament priest would use an animal sacrifice. You see, at the time the book of Hebrews was written, the temple in Jerusalem was still in existence, and, and the priests were still going about their duties, making sacrifices there. Uh, Jesus offered himself uh, once and for all in a sacrifice for all of mankind, so that all who accept this gift can have eternal life. Look at uh, verse 5 here. Verse 5, and it's talking about the priests who, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, he saith he, that thou make things according to the pattern shown thee in the mount. And it's talking about Mount Sinai there with Moses. God gave Moses the pattern to build the tabernacle and it was based on the, the heavenly tabernacle. And God warned Moses there. He said to follow these plans exactly and precisely. And so the, this tabernacle uh, although the plans were followed exactly, was only a copy of the, the true eternal heavenly tabernacle uh, that God uh, had, is in heaven. But God revealed this, uh, the plans of it to, to Moses. Later, the temple in Jerusalem replaced that tabernacle, but it too was, was based on that heavenly pattern 
which God had given. Now, much of the design of the tabernacle later, the temple points to Jesus Christ. Really, uh, uh, there's a whole study on, on, on the temple and all its furnishings and stuff, but just a few highlights, let me give them to you. Uh, the lampstand pointed to Christ as the light of the world. And that table of showbread symbolized him as the bread of life. That golden altar where the high priest offered prayers spoke of Christ as our great intercessor. And that holy of holies, uh, what was inside that Ark of the Covenant? And that contained the, the Ten Commandments written on those stone tablets, a pot of manna and, rose, and uh, um, Aaron's rod that uh, had, uh, was, uh, had started to branch out. It budded, had buds on it. Uh, and uh, the, ten, the Ten Commandments speak of the fact that Jesus came to fulfill the law. And he was the only one who kept it. And he kept it perfectly in all its detail. Now that pot of manna, well, that speaks of the fact that he is the bread of life. Even today, even today, we celebrate the Lord's table and it speaks of uh, Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. His bread is his body and, and uh, the grape juice is uh, his blood. And uh, so, so it was like uh, the pot of manna speaking of him. And, and then Aaron's rod that but it speaks of it came back to life that dead uh, branch that was uh, used as a, a rod yeah but it came back to life so that would of course speak of uh, Christ's resurrection now only once a year the high priest could enter that holy of holies in the in the tabernacle or the temple and that's because that's where God's presence was but when Christ died what happened that veil separated it was torn asunder, so to speak. It was torn in two pieces. So it opened up the door to that Holy of Holies. And that signified that Jesus had forever opened the way into the Holy of Holies and into the presence of God. The Holy of Holies is now in heaven, in the heavenly tabernacle where Jesus is ministering on our behalf. Because of Christ, we now have access to the very throne of God. Let me read verse 6 for you. And verse 6 says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So Christ's ministry in heaven is, far, is a far more important work than the Old Testament priests because of the wonderful promises of God in the new covenant. Now, Moses was the mediator between God and man. And he was the people's uh, spokesperson of the old covenant and the giving of the law. You see, the, the people of Israel around there in Mount Sinai were, were really, well, they were scared to death. They were so frightened because when God spoke, it was like thunder, you know, coming out, out at them. And so they begged Moses, you know, why don't you listen to God and then speak up and tell us what he said, you know. So they asked, begged him, begged him, in fact, they were so frightened, begged him to speak to them so they would, wouldn't would have to hear this uh, roaring thunder of God speaking. Well, that's what Moses did, but sad to say, that fear they had of God didn't last too long. For soon, they disobeyed the law they had promised to keep. The mediator of the new covenant is Jesus Christ. He's the only mediator. His ministry as mediator is more excellent than, than that of the Old Testament priests because it's based on a better covenant with better promises. Now look at uh, verse 7 here. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no have been sought for the second. Looking at that first part of, of verse 7, you read it, uh, for if that first covenant had been faultless, the first covenant wasn't adequate, which created a necessity for a better covenant, which was, which brings us to a question, well, if that wasn't uh, uh, working, if it was if it had been faultless, uh, there was, was there something wrong with it? Was there something wrong with that covenant, with that agreement? Did God make a mistake there? Well, let's look for the answer there. Look at verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, 
the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. So looking at that first part of that verse 8, it reads, For find fault with them. Find fault with them. Notice it says, it says them, not it. So you see, what do you see? The problem was never with God's covenant. There's nothing wrong with God's law. The problem is with the people, the people. The Israelites, as well as you and I, aren't able to keep the law. We're not able to measure up to its requirements. So God made a new covenant, which was foretold by Jeremiah and quoted in, in this verse. In fact, uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, 31 through 34 is quoted verbatim. In Hebrews chapter 8, the, the, in uh, verses 8 through 11. You know, speaking of Jeremiah, uh, it reminds me, Pastor is uh, doing a sermon series on Jeremiah. It just started up. There's no collusion between us, uh, uh, but it often, you know, I've been teaching Sunday school about 20, going on 20 years now, and uh, I taught Sunday school under Pastor Netzer, Pastor McClure, Pastor uh, Domowski, and, and now Pastor Hoppy. And it always amazes me, uh, without any collusion, we don't consult with any, uh, that this, how the Sunday school lesson always seems to tie in with the, the sermon. And uh, there's always something to be said. And that's, and that's truthful because God does speak to us and, and God does tie things together in his word. He speaks to each one individually through his word. Amen for that. Well, Jeremiah ministered during the closing years of the, uh, nation's history before Judah went into the Babylonian ca captivity. And it was at this time when the nation's future seemed completely destroyed that God gave this prophecy uh, of Jeremiah, the promise of a future restoration and blessing. You know, we're going through troubled tribes in our nation, and I can't say that we don't deserve it the way uh, some of the laws that were passed. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we always have that promise from God. If we turn to him, he will restore us and, and take us back. And I hope uh, our nation takes that to heart. So let me continue now with, with verse 9, which is uh, also uh, from the prophet uh, Jeremiah speaking. Uh, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Now the people, the people broke uh, the first covenant. They weren't able to keep the law without sinning. Uh, you know, the nation of Israel at Sinai uh, said, uh, and this is a quote from Exodus 24, verse three, all the words which the Lord had said, we will do, you know, when Moses came down and told them this and what the Lord said, they said, all the words that the Lord had said we will do. But they didn't obey the Lord's words. And it's one thing to say we will and quite another thing to do it. God led Israel out of Egypt uh, the way a father would take a child by the hand and lead him. God gave Israel his holy law for their own good. And that was to separate them from the other nations and protect them from those sinful practices of the heathens. But the nation failed. They continued not in God's covenant. And this verse tells us uh, God's responses to Israel's disobedience was to discipline them repeatedly. Finally, to send them into captivity, in this case, Babylon. You know, God did not find fault with his covenant, but with his people. The problem was not with the law, but with our own sinful natures. For by ourselves, we're not gonna be able to keep God's law. Hebrews 7.19 states that the law was not, made nothing perfect because it couldn't change the human heart. Now what changes the human heart? Well, it's God's grace that does that. The new covenant is holy of God's grace, so a sinner can become part of this new covenant uh, with, with faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, grace and faith go together just as law and the law and works go together. The law says, and this is a quote from uh, Galatians uh, 3.12, that a man doeth them the things that are written in the law. That's trying to get into heaven with your own works. 
and she'll, if you're going to do that, you got to live with, it with that rather than the, the complete cleansing of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you turn to Jesus, you get and you receive grace, the blessings, and the salvation, and his work is done, completed, removed all the sin from those that accept him and believe, and they have a new life in, in Christ. So that's a, a wonderful thing. Here. And now we move on to verse 10. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them on the hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And uh, so verse 10, uh, the new covenant was written on their hearts. It wasn't written on tablets of stone like the law was so that they would be able to obey it. Uh, the law of Moses could, uh, could declare God's holy standard, but it couldn't provide the power needed to obey the law. Sinful people needed a new heart and a new disposition uh, within. And this is just what the new covenant provides. It's the blessing of the new covenant. When a sinner trusts Christ, he receives a new nature, a divine nature within. And this divine nature creates a desire to love and to obey God. Now, moving on to verse 11. And 11 reads, And they shall, shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Through so Jesus Christ, there'll be full forgiveness of, of sin and complete pardon. There's no forgiveness under that Old Testament law. That law was given, not given for that purpose at all. It was given to show mankind that they're sinners in need of a savior. The, it's only through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that forgiveness is possible to all who will call upon him. The Old Testament sacrifices brought a remembrance of sins, not a remission of sins, uh, this verse, verse quotes Jeremiah, and it refers to a, a future promised kingdom. In that day, there's not going to be any need to share the gospel with others because everybody's going to know the Lord personally. But until that day, it is both our privilege and our responsibility to share the gospel message with the lost world. They certainly need it out there. And uh, now, looking at verse 12, for I will be merciful. Uh, to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. This verse states that God remembers our sins and our iniquities no more. Does it mean, does it mean that an all-knowing God can actually forget what we have done? You know, it comes to mind, if God forgot anything, then he wouldn't be God, would he? Because God is all-knowing. Uh, what that phrase, remember no more, means to hold it against us no more. God recalls what we have done, and, but he, he doesn't call, hold it against us. He deals with us on the basis of grace and mercy, not law and works. Uh, once sin has been forgiven, it is never brought before us again. No matter, the matter is eternally se settled before, the, before God. There is a lesson in this for us as well. Have you ever heard someone say, well, I can forgive that guy, but I can't forget what he had done to me. You know, of course we can't forget. The more we try to put an offense out of our mind, the more you're gonna remember. But that isn't what it means to forget. To forget means, as we say with God, not to hold it against the person that has wronged us. We might remember what others have done, but we treat them as though they never did it at all. How is that possible, you might say? Well, it's possible because of the cross. For there God treated his son as though he had done the sins that were placed upon him. Our experience of forgiveness from God makes this possible for us to forgive others. Look at verse 13 now. Verse 13. In that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old, and now that which decayed, waxed old, is ready to vanish away. Ready to, to just move away. The old, that old covenant 
and my pages are stuck together here, here we go, was still governing the nation, the nation of Israel at the time this letter was written. That temple, uh, when this, uh, this uh, book of Hebrews was uh, written, was still standing, and the priests were still there going about their business on the appointed sacrifices, and devout Jews were probably, they, they probably thought their, their Jew, these Jewish converts, their Christian, now Christian friends, were foolish to abandon such a solid religion that had been around for centuries for a faith that was seemingly intangible. What those unbelieving Jews didn't realize was that their solid religion had grown old and was about to vanish away. For, you know, in 70 AD, that city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Romans. And the Jews did not have a temple or a priesthood to serve them ever since that day. Ever since that. However, the new covenant brings eternal blessings through Jesus Christ, who, who brought us eternal salvation and eternal redemption. The new covenant can never get old and disappear. It's perfect. Never needs to be replaced. Our Lord is ministering on the basis of a superior covenant, and the new covenant makes us partakers of a new nature. And the whole new want to, as it was explained to me, when you receive Christ, you get a whole new want to. You don't want to do them old things that were sinful. You want to do the things that the Lord uh, puts in your heart. And it's a wonderful new life that only Christ can give. Now, let me give you a little recap of what we went over here. And let me sum it up, so to speak. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8 talks about Jesus being the high priest of this new covenant is seated on the right hand of the throne and he serves in the sanctuary which is the true tabernacle of the lord as something that wasn't built by human hands as the earthly tabernacle the sanctuary that was built on earth was just a shadow or a replica of the one in, in heaven this is why god told moses to build a sanctuary just like the pattern that he had shown him there when he was up on that mount sinai now the ministry that christ uh, Jesus received was superior to that old covenant. The new covenant, Christ has better promises as we went over there. The old covenant was based on law, which we couldn't keep. Men kid, couldn't keep the law. Uh, so what, that's why we had to have a new one. And uh, that new one had to be given. You know, you wonder, well, God is all knowing. Why didn't he give us a new one to start with? You know, so you, when you lead somebody to Christ, they got to know they're a sinner. They got to know, see the need for salvation. So this old covenant with the law showed man as sinners in need of a savior. And we had the Old Testament prophets promising that one was come. So that's that's the re reason that God had that old covenant, and now we got the new one, and we're living in the new covenant age. So the writer of Hebrews quotes from the book of Jeremiah as he explains about this new covenant, and Jeremiah. That was way back when, you know, before they went into Babylonian ca captivity, he was telling them, you know, a new covenant's coming, a new savior's coming, the savior's coming. You're going to be, uh, you know, a better age is coming. Better things are in the future. So the 31st chapter of Jeremiah speaks of this new covenant. And the prophet, prophet was told that his people should wait on the Lord. Many people strayed from the Lord, even though he had been faithful to them. So Jeremiah spoke how they had hardened their hearts in Egypt. Once the new covenant had been made, he said, no one should need to teach their neighbor about who the Lord was, because everyone on earth would know his name. They would forget, he would forgive their weakness, wickedness and sin from the least, uh, and the sins from the least to the greatest person on earth. That's a, a, the, talking about the, the future, the future life when the Jews would be uh, look to the Lord and, and accept Jesus as Savior. So uh, we're going to look at the, the blessings of this new covenant in a little more detail next week. But for now, I, I'd ask you to focus on, on Jesus Christ, who's seated at the right hand of the, of the Father on high, is the mediator of that new covenant. So we need to each day seek to know him, to love him, to glorify him, because he gave himself on the cross for you. And for me, and Christianity requires obedience, but not the external obedience of rules and rituals, but the obedience is from the heart out of love for God. Therefore, uh, let me let me read uh, from Colossians. I'll close with this. Uh, 
before I go to prayer here. Uh, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. I got it in my Bible here. I just found that uh, to this morning as I was doing my prayers this morning. It says, if, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affect, affle, affection on the things above, not on the things of this earth. For, uh, for, for you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear then shall you also appear with him in glory so and and then uh, it's just a, a wonderful promise we have with the lord but let's look to the lord in prayer as i, I bring uh, this uh, session to a close heavenly father we thank you for the uh, the promises we have in your word and the fact that we do have a mediator uh, up in heaven on your son jesus christ who died for our sins and provided for our salvation Lord, we're so grateful for that. And the fact that we can come, indeed, come before your throne each day with our needs, and you do hear, and you certainly do answer prayer. We're just so grateful for that. And we just give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you. Our Sunday service is going to start at 10 a.m. right here on Zoom. And I hope you'll join us and uh, as we worship the Lord. And I hope to see you again next Sunday. God bless. Bye-bye. All right, thank, thank you very much, Jim. And uh, again, we'll be starting at 10 a.m. here in the church sanctuary. And thank you for that message, Jim. And I will play some music in the background now. And uh, we'll begin at 10 a.m. Thank you again for joining us for Sunday School at Bible Church of Lakeshore. Good to see you all uh, joining us here. And uh, we'll begin our morning service at 10 a.m. Thank you, Jim. All right.